So a lot of times stress can be related to some kind of worry. Well, naming what the worry is and then trying to take a a step or an action towards that worry. Um, You know, if you're worried about the companionship, if you're worried about safety, like what's one thing that you could do to try to mitigate that, but then trying the different things on, like it's, you know, I started saying in the beginning about how it was like a game for me where I would just like pay attention to what was, what people were talking about that was making them feel like it was a stress relief. And I thought, well, people talk about this all the time. Let me try this or let me try that. Hey, y'all, this is Costa. And today I'm here with my guest, Elizabeth Miller, certified care consultant and founder of the Happy Healthy Caregiver, a resource hub, podcast, and community of caregivers growing and sharing tips, resources, and support to create happier and healthier lives for caregivers. Today, we're talking about how to care for the caregiver. So to start, will you tell us about Happy Healthy Caregiver, how you became a family caregiving advocate, and what attracted you to this industry? Well, it wasn't necessarily something I intentionally set out to do. It was a need that I saw through my own personal experiences of being a family caregiver. So I cared for my parents who had chronic comorbidities. And also I have an older brother that has a developmental and intellectual disability. So I've seen caregiving from many parts my entire life, but things really started spiraling for my husband and I in 2014 when we were working full time and we were raising our own children and caregiving for our family members started to really take a priority and we were losing our minds. And I kept kind of turning for places to go that could help me provide support and resources to help me through this really difficult season of my life. And I was coming up empty. It's astounding because you would expect that, you know, something as important as providing like care for a human being, you know, it's like doing your taxes. There's an H&R block on every single corner, right? But there's really nothing out there. So when you made that realization, like, uh, I'm on my own, like, what'd you, how, how did you climb out of that hole, essentially? Yeah. I mean, my personality is definitely like a roll up your sleeves and, and nice. figure it out. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, but I, at first I didn't go there. First, I was just starting to kind of wither and lots of tears and frustration. And then I thought, this is, this is not how I want to live my life. And I'm also very, you know, it's apparent that little people are watching me on how I'm living my life and potentially modeling that. So I, um, just started writing. It was basically what I was doing to, to help provide some emotional relief for me and kind of just process what was going on in my life. It was something I had studied way back in college and then have always been trying to write and do something uh, as a way to kind of heal and process things. So that was my first kind of endeavor in it. And then it became kind of a, a little bit of a game I was playing with myself, frankly, about like, okay, if I want to, I see these people that I'm caring for that have made different lifestyle choices that have put me in a, in this situation. If I keep putting myself last on this list, interesting, I'm going to keep, I'm going to essentially repeat the same cycle for my, for my kids. And yeah. my husband and I had this intentional conversation and really decided that that wasn't something that we were willing to do. So we had to try on different things that were self-care for us so that yeah. we could um, tell a different story. Yeah. I mean, was it a significant transition? Like, has your life changed dramatically since this experience? Yes, I mean, wow. I'm, it changed in my career, frankly, right? Like, yeah. so I did IT and strategy, <laughs> wow. made a really nice living doing that. And I immediately thought when I started, became a primary caregiver for my sure. mom, like, I've got to figure out how I can have <clears throat> full-time flexibility. This is not, this is not sustainable for me. This is not viable. And that was where the business idea started is like, look, I'm not the only one in this situation at the time. I didn't know, but there's, you know, 53 million plus caregivers just in the U S alone, family caregivers. So, but at the time I just knew that this was something that was going to come into people's lives. But yeah, now it's my full-time job since 2021. I, and there's a growing need for it. You know, it's, that's 15%, 
right? Yeah, that's that's fifteen percent of the U.S. population. Yeah, I think it's one in one in five. Wow, or something. That's incredible. Yeah, twenty yeah, percent, I guess. Wow. And a lot of people are, you know, sixty percent of caregivers are working, yeah. and th- and that's where you know I, and I'm hoping, being a caregiver and being a caregiver on wow. top of that. So it you know it was definitely like I had added another part time job onto my life, and that was even with my mom in an assisted living community. You know, that is a misnomer that there's not a caregiving role for those people. There is still a significant caregiving role and a massive expense, right? So the even more of a reason why I needed to keep working. And, you know, I'm excited that employers are paying attention to really investing in their employees who are working family caregivers and right. trying to provide the support and resources to help them. Absolutely. And so you touched on a few things um, that you did, like writing, uh, having those intentional conversations with your family um, to promote your own self care. What other things can you offer um, our listeners uh, so that caregivers can find balance and also emphasize self care for themselves? I think at first, you know, I thought a lot about physical self care, like eating right and exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's self care for caregivers goes way beyond that. It is about, you know, asking for help creating your care team of, of people, sure. um, doing things that are going to help simplify your systems that of how you care and put those into place. That's so it's not just the physical self care. It's, you know, emotional through meditation and yoga and writing. It's spiritual. It's social through connecting with other caregivers, practical through getting your care team set up, uh, setting boundaries, all kinds of things. So, you know, when, when I say happy, healthy caregiver, like it's not necessarily about those weekends away and the, the respite that we all are kind of craving for, but really the intentional things that we can do in our everyday life to kind of microdose self-care so that this can be a sustainable journey. Can I ask you a question that's kind of, I don't want it to be complicated, but it may come out complicated. So I've never been a caregiver, uh, yes. but I do have kids. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I have. So obviously in the, in the business that my wife and I own, you know, I've, I've worked on shift before and I've provided the same tasks, but being a caregiver for a day is much different than being a caregiver for years and years and years. Right. I have kids, uh, four of them. Uh, that are eight and younger. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. And I understand as you're, as you're explaining it, I'm thinking to myself like, yeah, those are all things that I also have to do for myself. Like, you know, I have to find time to exercise. I have to find time to be grateful and be happy and mm-hmm. ha- be in the right mental state. So this is why I feel like this question may be somewhat complicated. When you spend so much time taking care of your children, raising your kids, just to arrive to the stage in your life where you're expecting some freedom, I guess, and you then end up having to take care of your parents Mm. without many resources at all. Similar to, I mean, is it fair to say that there's more resources for kids than there are for for the elderly elderly individuals? Well, I mean, I think for sure, because people, people go into that role, first of all, like, usually not by accident, Um, but there's so many books and there's so many things and it's a, it's a time of celebration when you're, when you're having it, bringing a child into the world and people are identifying role, right. With the role of being a mom or being a dad, whereas being a family (laughs) caregiver, isn't something that necessarily people are owning that role. And then I think if they are kind of unwilling to accept that role, then it is more difficult to find the resources and support that are going to help them. And, you know, I think to your point, yeah, is there resentment? Of course. I mean, I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things we don't talk about sometimes is a lot of the negative emotions that go with caregiving. And, and yet, yes, and like, there's a lot of joy that comes in that caregiving moments too. Like, I mean, I have the, the, gifts of spending a lot more time with my parents, sure. um, during their final act of life than I potentially right. would have they, you know, just something suddenly happened to them before they, sure. they passed on. So it's, it's both. I think, I think very, 
it's not often that there's like a, you know, really solid answer on some things, but it's a really a cornucopia of different emotions and they can all happen within the same day, just as, as, you know, I think in some ways similar to parenting, but I would say the one main difference is that, you know, eventually your kids are going to be more and more independent and they're going to go off into their own and, you know, unless there's some kind of a, a special needs situation there, but with your older adults and a lot of the folks that we're taking care of, it's usually the opposite where, yeah. you know, it's kind of as good as it gets on day one and then things can continue to decline, which is even more of a reason why we have to proactively have these conversations and set ourselves up for sustainable success because it's, it gets harder. Yeah. Yeah. And you need to set those expectations. That was a fascinating explanation. I always love doing these shows and like, I'll, I, I, you know, you you do so many of them, and you think, okay, well, I figured it out, and <laughs> then you hear something like that, and you're like, wow, I never really thought about that. It's a really interesting perspective. So, Thank I want to know, though, in your opinion, what do you think is the greatest challenge that's facing caregivers today? I think that we're being asked to do a lot. You know, we are we can't wait kind of for the government to kind of figure out the answers because it's a very slow process and very few people qualify for Medicaid. And, you know, the 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 number of faces I've seen of people where they first are finding out for the first time that Medicare does not pay for long term care. It is shocking to people. You got to say that again, though. Medicare does not pay for long term care. Like, yes. it surprised yes. me and it surprises people. And, the, the and, and it's hard to get on Medicaid. Like even my mother-in-law, she got denied so many times and all mm-hmm. she had was her social security check, which was like $800. And my husband and I were scratching our head and we're like, who gets approved for Medicaid if she, if she can't get approved? So it's, so the, the struggle with caregivers then is that, you know, more people are wanting to age in place at home, which I think, you know, if you and I had the choice when we get older, that would be our choice, sure. right? To be, Absolutely. to be at home as long as possible yes. until that we cannot do that. And, but who is bridging the gap then for, to make that possible is this, growing segment of people, family caregivers, who are also contributing to the workforce, who are also, you know, raising responsible, independent kids someday. And so it's a lot of being asked and it's a big strain. And so what I'm hoping will happen is that there will be more resources for caregivers where we can either get paid, you know, get paid for the care that we're providing at home and have more respite opportunities because we all are desperate for a break. It's a really, yeah. a really hard situation. And it's an, what's, what's interesting about that statement specifically is it's not that family caregivers are shucking the work of being a caregiver. They're not saying like, Oh, I'm not, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. You pay for it. They're not saying that they're like, okay, listen, I will do it. But I mean, you know, Usually, Can I get some financial people, assistance? Yeah, somebody in the yeah. family is usually stepping up. Now, yeah. I'm one of six right. kids, and I will say we are not all... <laughs> on the same page. All, right. Yeah, so there's always yeah. usually... And it, but and, within the family, yes. though, there's typically somebody. There's and so that means somebody. that for every, fa- for every nucleus of a family or nuclei of a family, you're going to have somebody that is going to be the primary caregiver. That person... I mean, probably can't work full time. Sometimes, in instances of like individuals who have Alzheimer's or dementia, they may not even be able to work part time. And you know, to hire a caregiver, to hire another human being to care for another human being, you got to. It's expensive because you're paying a person, right? And you're not a business; you're just a family, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's it's astounding to me, and it's similar to like whenever during the pandemic when they started to pay for for um, for daycare. You know, they they made daycare free, or they provided some type of subsidy. Like, why not use that exact same method to be able to help family caregivers have the funds to be able to feed, you know, their themselves and their families? And I mean, you could you could reduce the amount of of resources that taxes the industry um, and you can create what I believe is really the only solution. Technology, which is what we're going to talk about next, is one serious one. But. A real solution is more multi-generational families. That is probably the key 
to, to solving this problem, but it's going to come from policy change. Yeah. I mean, that's how it used to be, right? We used to have these multi-generational care, but the big difference there is that we didn't have people living as long. You know, we didn't have the, the, the the cost of the way things are today with gas and food, where most, most people have to have a dual income family in order to, uh, to have that same lifestyle that we grew up having and people are living point. longer, right? Like medicines and think, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, yeah. We, we've got some advancements in health and things that are happening, but that's a long time that people can, can, to try to fill the gap. And I, I do caution people from, you know, I speak at, uh, for a lot of employers. And I think sometimes the first instinct can be like, Oh, I got to quit my job. I got to do this. And maybe, you know, try it, you know, slip into it, try FMLA and things like that if, as you can, because sure. Otherwise, we're also creating this same systemic problem, right? Like if I don't work and I don't have the money, like who's going to pay for my care when I'm like, it just right. gets That's worse. True. <laughs> That's true. Well, it is a, it is a very complicated, it's complicated. problem. It's really diving into There's an it. answer yeah. though. I do think that that's a start. And there are some states that do pay their caregiver that, that you, you know, it's not, it's a, it's, there's a process in place. I know Colorado is one of them. Georgia is not one of them where you can, you know, yeah. pay uh, an informal caregiver. Um, but it's, it's, it's to everybody's benefit, right. To keep these people um, out of the hospital systems out of all right. of that. So if we can kind of come together and figure out some kind of solution, I think, I think it's probably not like a one answer solution. It's a, it's a bunch of different things. And I'm encouraged that, you know, while the government is figuring out what they, what they've got going on, there are a lot of companies and peep startup companies that are really trying to attack this problem. Sure. Absolutely. And so on the, on the note of startups, what role is technology currently playing in helping caregivers manage their responsibilities, and how do you see it being used in the future? I mean, I think there's a lot of ways. I, I say that technology really is part of the care team, you know, so it's yeah. you family, friends, home care, technology. Like, it can help you simplify things, you know, everything from, you know, meal delivery services to, you know, ordering your groceries um, having, having different tasks done for you. There's a lot of apps that are out there that can help you communicate with your care team and um, also uh, request help that way. So remote monitoring, I think is another way where caregivers are getting peace of mind, particularly like not everybody lives with their person, right? Like maybe they live close by or across the country, a long distance support caregiver. And so it's, there's ways then that you can kind of keep tabs on your loved one through technology and have that peace of mind without physically being there, which is nice. Yeah. There's a couple of um, companies uh, in our in our geographical area in the southeast of the U.S. Um, that <clears throat> use a combination of sensors passive uh, monitoring, um, and a lot of it is based around data collection. Mm -hmm. And so, like, for example, as you're describing, like, with, you know, somebody that's caring for for their mom or dad and they live in a different state even, you know, you can use these... This data, these data sensors, chair alarms, you know, or bed sensors, chair sensors. And if somebody's sitting in a recliner the entire, you know, for like six hours straight and you ha- can read that data, you know, obviously something may be awry and you could, you know, maybe have a wellness check or something like that happen. But I believe, in my opinion, that technology is a quintessential application to solving the lack of of caregivers that are available um, to, because there's a lot for the, for the people who don't have family Mm. to care for them. Because uh, what I've noticed uh, working in, in this industry is there are many people that are on the Medicaid side of things who are completely alone. And as a provider, as a company, we uh, step in essentially to become their natural supports uh, and try to provide the best quality of life possible. And yeah, that's um, tough. there's not a lot of, 
Yeah, there's not a lot of people who are stepping up and wanting to be caregivers nowadays. No, it's a tough it's a tough position um, to be in, and you know, there's also this whole thing about social isolation. So particularly if people don't have somebody that is, you know, checking in with them frequently, there is some technology even that is trying to handle that, where like they can have a conversation um, beyond Alexa, but like learning people's behaviors and having conversations with you know, some sort of a robot type of thing. Well, there are, yeah, it's like a Rosie or something or Rosa. So I was listening to NPR and one a, and they actually were profiling a nursing home, um, that launched some type of like robot that tell jokes, Yeah, you can ask, that tells exactly. jokes and delivers meals and stuff. And they'll yeah. just, you know, Hey, yeah. so, I mean, you want to some... listen to some Frank Sinatra? Like they kind of learn your patterns yeah. and behaviors. The one I know of is called LEQ, um, is the okay. same type of thing, but lots of different things there. So I'm excited to see, you know, particularly with my IT background, like I love kind of when these two, the, my worlds are colliding, uh, right. and there is a lot of opportunity and we're going to need technology to help bridge that gra- gap for sure. Yeah. Well, we could have a whole show just on technology mm-hmm. alone in this space. So, but let's get, we're going to, we're going to side back to uh, slide back to caregiving as a caregiver. How do you manage stress and avoid burnout and how do these feelings normally manifest? Well, it's a roller coaster, right? Like they, um, there's a, I think most caregivers kind of like their first go-to is to kind of like, well, I'm just going to do more. I'm going to do more. And then you kind of figure out that that's not sustainable and all the systems start to break down. Um, And I think there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of manage stress. But for me and for other people listening, like self-care looks differently for all of us. Like I know for me, it's, it's about like, what's going to give me energy, what's going to provide peace of mind. Um, and really like naming my worry. So a lot of times stress can be related to some kind of worry. Well, naming what the worry is and then trying to take a a step or an action towards that worry. Um, You know, if you're worried about the companionship, if you're worried about safety, like what's one thing that you could do to try to mitigate that, but then trying the different things on, like it's, you know, I started saying in the beginning about how it was like a game for me where I would just like pay attention to what was what people were talking about that was making them feel like it was a stress relief. And I thought, well, people Mm -hmm. talk about this all the time. Let me try this or let me try that. Um, And you won't know until you try it on what works for you. But some things could be, you know, think about your five senses, you know, aromatherapy, you know, getting outside in nature, listening to music, could be writing, could be journaling. And I think the point is, is like, it doesn't have to be, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. It's like little incremental things. Um, I really (laughs) challenge people when they say they don't have time for self-care because it's not an all or nothing thing. There's, we all have to create the time. It doesn't just, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, you've really created an incredible resource for caregivers and prospective caregivers alike. Thank you. Walk us, walk us through happy, healthy caregiver and its most commonly utilized resources. So it's evolved over the years, right? I've thrown a lot of spaghetti to see what sticks. Um, and <laughs> Best yeah, way to do it. And so, you know, I, be, I became a certified caregiving consultant because I wanted to help myself and, and coach sure. others. So I do offer complimentary coaching for an initial session. The podcast is, is full of resources. I mean, I believe that family caregivers are the experts in caregiving and family caregiving. So that's that's what you'll find on the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast is over 150 episodes sharing caregiving and self-care tips. Um, speaking is something that is really a, a main way that I monetize my business. So speaking with groups sure. of you know employee resource groups, affinity groups, different organizations that are celebrating what caregivers are doing. And then I love to collaborate with partners who are trying to put their brand out in front of the world, you know, the technology companies and so forth we talked about. I want want to be that Mm -hmm. that conduit to really fast track caregivers to the to the resources so that they're not fumbling and and stumbling over over the things but I can really kind of pull them up and be like okay we've got this um so those are some of the things that I that I provide through happy healthy caregiver I love that why do you think that more people don't embrace technology like 
just something as simple as the as uh, having a conversation like electronically as opposed to face to face like a two way ipad right like why a lot of times people like feel ashamed to call somebody on an iPad as opposed to going in person. And if they, if they're out of state, especially like that may be the only form of communication except for maybe some unique periods when, you know, they're visiting. Right. Why do you think the caregivers are ashamed of, of taking kind of the easier approach? The caregivers or the care recipients. I mean, I think it could be either, right? Like they got to kind of meet sure. in the middle. Um, I would say that that's moving in the right direction, that more people are open to it. I think they just don't have the time to research. So, you know, if somebody's yeah. listening to this and they're more of a support caregiver for somebody who's a primary family caregiver, then that is something like at a distance as a support caregiver, you can do for somebody is like figure it all out and then just show up mm-hmm. with the system and be like, hey, I found this thing. Like, let's let's try it and see if this works. Sure. Um, you know, I went, you know, I want to help you figure this out. Um, but some of it I think is pride and just, you know, people are stubborn and, um, trying new things can be a fearful thing. Maybe it's a a fear of privacy for some things. Uh, so it's, I think it just depends. Yeah. What do you, what do you typically tell people who are financially ill-equipped to handle, uh, taking care of an aging parent or taking care of themselves who may be aging um, and have no, like, what do, what do you tell them is like the first three steps aside from obviously what you would do internally for yourself as a caregiver, but how do they get through that? I mean, Where there are some start? things they can do that don't cost anything, right? Like there's okay. like some things are connecting to support for themselves is a okay. way because nobody's going to understand your situation like another family caregiver. And you can do that virtually or there might be an in-person group that because mm-hmm. they're going to help problem solve that for you. So that's free, frankly. Um, and then, you know, gathering your care team. If you think that this can be a solo caregiving job, it can't be. And so there are some resources that I provide for people to really divide and conquer their responsibilities. And, you know, maybe there's things that they could do to barter with people to, um, um, to, to trade for services, uh, sometimes a, a, a reduced rate for respite care. Like there are some um, day programs for, for folks with dementia that can be very affordable for an all okay. day um, education. And then, of course, you know, maybe they have somebody that has a veteran. There, there could be some veteran benefits that they could get. Or, sure. of course, they can um, look into the, the Medicaid route for things. Um, uh, yeah, I know for me, like I'm looking ahead, like I'm 51 years old. So like, I'm thinking about like, yeah. how are my kids going to pay for my husband? You know, how, how are they going to sure. handle this situation if we don't have enough money to, to frankly pay for it? So one yeah. of the things that we did proactively is we got something on our life insurance called a living benefit, which I didn't, wasn't aware of. Um, but that's something right. that, you know, if certain things are true that we could maybe we can draw upon this life insurance policy. Sure. Because, you know, long-term care insurance is expensive and it's not something that extremely it's extremely expensive, expensive um, particularly yeah. when you're over 50. So it's, um, yeah. it's not, you know, it's not a sustainable, what would you add to that coast? I'm curious. Well, so what I typically tell people, and I am very, I'm very pragmatic because obviously being in this industry for for a while, like I know what works and what doesn't. And usually what happens is everybody wants Medicaid because, well, I don't want to, I don't want to put everybody in that, in that bucket, but most people, if they knew what Medicaid paid for, pay what Medicaid would pay for and what it provided in terms of long-term care services, Mm -hmm. they'd be like, yeah, I want it. What, What do I need to do? You know, and Tennessee is a asset relinquishment mm-hmm. state. I, I don't know if Georgia is, but in Tennessee, if you want to apply for Medicaid and you have assets, they'll let you apply, but you have to sign all your assets over to the okay. state. Okay. Yeah. It's so, like, if you have a by house, state. I don't know exactly what we have. Like, but yeah. I, Which is why Medicaid is so complicated to mm-hmm. begin with, because there's 50 different approaches to it, right? Which is another, like, that's, that's a third podcast that we can do. <laughs> so, um, So there's a huge bargain that you have to make if you want Medicaid, which is essentially you give up all your generational wealth. And you may end up giving it up anyway if you're paying for long-term care out of pocket. But um, 
the, the long and short of, of what I'm trying to say is what I tell most people is if you actually have a loved one who is who has suffered a significant medical event, a lot of times if you can um, if you get placed into a nursing facility, you can transition to Medicaid within that facility through their social work mm. services. And um, it's it's you got to really have a, a stomach for it, though. Yeah, there's because, a, it's a process. It, you know, it, yeah. it's, no matter what state and you, you have live to in, be, it's a process. Right. You have to be almost like, I can't take care of my mom or dad unless I have help. And, and, and you can't, literally, you cannot deviate from that message. Because the only way that you're going to get Medicaid or get any kind of support, because, you know, those social workers at the nursing homes know everything. They know all the programs and how they operate, and they know how to access right. them, and they have all the contacts. But unless you're saying, like, they're going to stay here and you can't bill for those services because their Medicare days have run out and they're not on Medicaid and we don't have anything to pay for them out of pocket. They won't do anything to find, you know, an, a, a solution to, to what becomes their problem. Uh, and that's what I do. I tell people, I tell people to leverage everything that they have to try to get Medicaid. It's, it's a crazy, it, it is crazy advice, yeah. but it, well, and not, but not all the, the communities maybe that you or I might want to live in will accept Medicaid either. So that's, you know, oh, so you're definitely, um, you've got to that's kind of point. like lay out all the options. Um, I think another underlie underutilized service that is available, if somebody is really, you know, in a chronic situation, um, maybe potentially has six months or less to live is hospital. I think a lot of people, yeah. and that is something that Medicare mm -hmm. will typically pay for is hospice services. And I think that is an underutilized service. Yeah. And I think, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but also palliative care. Yeah. Palliative right? care, yes, is, a, you know, is, is treating the symptoms and you can have that, you right. know, at any, it doesn't have to have that six month or less, but I will say like my mom lived for two years on hospice. She was reevaluated, you know, every 60, 90 days. Could she have yeah. passed away in the next six months? Yes, she could have, you know, she was bedridden the last two years of her life. Um, oh, wow. so it's, it, uh, it, you don't know unless you ask the questions, right? And everybody's situation Absolutely. is different. But I think that there's not enough education around palliative care and hospice care. And again, that's where like the free Good thing point. of support, like if you get plugged in, you will hear it all because you're learning a whole new vocabulary and a set of terms right. that have right. never, you know, it's not a book you've ever wanted to pick up before. Like it's <laughs> I, and, and I think the best thing, and you said it earlier in the show, the best thing that people need to, to know uh, at an early age is, and this will keep them, you know, at least abreast of the fact that they need to prepare in some capacity is that Medicare doesn't pay for long-term care. That's like, it. What's your in a plan? nutshell. What's your plan? You're listening. Right. Exactly. Like, what is your plan? Exactly. And to have those co yeah. courageous conversations now, like to have them now mm -hmm. so that when you, um, you can avoid the headaches as much as possible later and allow people the privilege. Like I'm so grateful, right. That my parents had, first of all, the financial means to pay for their care. Right. And secondly, the, right. all of their paperwork in order. It made us as their kids, uh, uh, we were allowed to just kind of be in that moment. Like it was still terrifically hard and emotionally draining, but thank goodness we didn't have to make those types of decisions about yeah. what, what they wanted. Like it was very clearly indicated and we could simply follow yeah. directions and really focus on being present and handling the crisis of the day. Absolutely. There is one more thing before I wrap up. There is um, a disability trust, I think it's called. Um, I had I had a, a friend of mine who's a, an attorney here in town, and we talked a lot about disability trust. So it's a real technical episode if you want to check it out. Um, but you can get a disability trust at an early age. Yes. And if there is a look back period for Medicaid in your state, which most states have a, a five, you know, three to five year look back period. Um, 
the disability trust kind of interjects and says, whoa, 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 you don't need a look back period because all of this money is in a trust and so the state can't touch it and you still qualify for Medicaid and your your assets are protected. So that's that's another yes. part a special of the needs. I, I know my brother has a special needs, special trust, needs trust, which is which yeah. I'm grateful that was, you know, again, a smart dad that set that up for my brother, yeah. you know, who's now yeah. approaching his sixtieth birthday and we have we are his caregivers, right? The siblings now mm-hmm. for him. So he is he does have that. I don't know the all the ins and outs of the of the special needs trust, but I Same. do know that it's um is something that is really helpful in our situation for his care. I am curious about something though. Like, um, what, sorry, what, um, and it's a little bit taboo, but I think it's a really important conversation. What should we do when personally providing caregiving supports for our loved one is no longer an option? I, I, mean, I think we all have to think that through, right? Is like what what is our boundaries of what we're willing to take on and impact? Like I yeah. know for me, like even even my brother's situation, like it wasn't an option for him to come and live live with us because I had young daughter and sometimes he could be inappropriate. And so you have to kind of figure mm-hmm. out your boundaries on that and. Um, and know what you need to be true. Like I knew I needed to keep working. So for mom to move, she needed to live in an assisted living and, and what my role um, was was going to be like. But to have those conversations because it's, and we all have different um, strengths, right? Like I will say it honestly, sure. like I'm, I'm a way better advocate for family caregivers than I am a hands-on family caregiver for my, my family members. Right. And that is because like, I'm kind of a tough love caregiver. Like I was that person with my mom, like, come on, mom, you can do that for yourself. Like knowing that really she's part of her, she was a part of her own care team. And that while it might be easier for me to do things for her, it was part of her occupational therapy, her physical therapy to do it herself. And so I would constantly say to her, you need to meet me halfway. I don't think that makes me a bad caregiver. It's just like, I might not have that nurturing um, Gene is much like, I'm like, let's figure this out. Let's do this together. Whereas like my older sister is the, you know, epitome of what you, every, anybody would want her to be their caregiver. She's amazing. <laughs> she cooks amazing. I'm not a great cook, like all of that. Yeah. So, um, I love yeah. it. I love it. So we always like to end the show with a call to action. What's your advice for anyone that is struggling today as a caregiver and feels like they need help. I would, we, we touched on these already, but like the first thing is to seek support and, you know, Mm -hmm. you can set up a complimentary coaching call with me. We can talk through that. Um, you can Google it in your area, the name of your town, caregiver support, see what comes up and don't wait too long. I think people wait till there's a crisis I'll do that when like, no, do it proactively, do it when it's not a crisis so that you have Mm -hmm. all your options in place. You have your people in place so that when the crisis happens, then it's just going to be something that's more easily resolved that way. And then as a, as a follow up to that too, like schedule your time for yourself. Like it's, you're not going to find it. You've got to create it. And so just put it as a wellness appointment for yourself on your calendar of what that, what that can look like. Um, and have it something so that you can look forward to having it 